All right, wonderful. Well, um, thank you guys. Thank you for the invitation. First of all, through um, Terry, she kind of connected me through into with Ray and had a little chat with Ray, I think earlier this week or last week. And um, yeah, I just appreciate the invitation and um, the opportunity to get to speak with you and, and share a little bit about my work and my experiences, um, photography, what it means to me, how I go about my work and the opportunities and um, places that photography has, has taken me over the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, whatever it's been since I, I've been taking photos. So um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ryan Carter, as you've uh, been introduced already. So <laughs> I'm a, a photographer based now currently in Adelaide, in South Australia, of course. Um, but primarily the majority of my work is, is humanitarian based, um, working with different NGOs, uh, different ministries, different organizations around the world, um, and helping them tell their stories of the people that they're working with, the situations that they're um, working in, and the, and the people and, and places and situations that are going on around the world. So um, as you know, there's a lot of issues all around the world and, and a lot of things going on. Um, so the the joy of my work is everything is very varied. I get to work in some amazing places, some places that are a little more um, dangerous than others, um, and some just places that are just stunningly beautiful, and I get to meet some amazing people from all over the place. So tonight, I just want to share a little bit about some of my stories, some of the background behind some of my pictures. Um, I don't know if anyone here has seen many of my pictures before or um, have any idea who I am or if I'm a complete newbie to you all. Um, but hopefully tonight you can just sort of get a bit of a, an overview and understanding of, of who I am and of, of what I do. Uh, so, All right. So I've got a little, just a little quote here that um, I can't even remember who told me this. It was a long time ago. It was someone that I worked with, with through, you know, he was a, a designer I think actually but um, in the, the area of, of photography he said you know something that we do as creatives is, is making poetic observations of subjects that matter um, and I thought that was a very apt way of putting what I, I do um, poetic observations like I, I love to create beautiful things I'm sure as photographers you're all the same um, you see something beautiful a sunset a person a face a child a, a scene somewhere an object a plate of food whatever it is we see something beautiful and how do we create that into something nice and, and that's what we've all learned to do as photographers right is, is to to find something beautiful and try and replicate that through either film or now digitally and um, then either to present that through social media, through our screens, through print, um, whatever medium we end up using. For me, a big part of that is the, the second part of that little quote is the subjects that matter. Um, I've worked in the advertising world here in Adelaide for quite a while as well. And as much as the work is interesting, it's varied, it's, it's, it can be a lot of fun. Um, I find I really find a lot of fulfillment in my work as a humanitarian photographer because of the subjects that matter. It's finding these beautiful scenes, these amazing places, these interesting people and telling their story, um, sharing the hope that they have, sharing the hardships, the struggles that they have. And then through photos, through images, being able to help the organizations that are working with them to bring um, whether it's funding, whether it's just general awareness, um, whether it's new programs to help the situation of, of the people um, in the different places that I work. So I first talked to, to, to Terry um, about my work in Congo because she's connected with Hand Up Congo there in Sydney. And um, it's uh, Congo is a place that's on my heart that I love, um, that I've had a opportunity to visit quite a few times now and, and do some work in. Um, but outside of, of Congo, I have traveled quite extensively to, to many other places and lived a lot of a lot of places around the world as well. So here's just a couple of images from um, Nepal, where I've been on a few different occasions. Um, one of them on the left here is this lady, she's knitting, and I worked with a social business um, who they create handcrafted products. So scarves, hats, mittens, half mittens, things like that. Um, but it's all women who are bought out of either come out of trafficking 
um, or are at high risk of trafficking or have no means to provide for themselves and their family. So the, the organization called Denadi, they take these women on, they train them in knitting, and then they can get a wage and can better their situation and hopefully get out of their, the situation that they're in and improve the, the lives of themselves and their family, their children can get to school, things like that. So I've worked with them on multiple occasions, um, different uh, programs that they're running and being able to photograph all the women that are involved in their, their courses and in their, their business there. Um, and that's also then helped to promote the work and to sell the work you know, end of the day, as a business, you need to sell things. Um, and so being able to share those marketing images and stuff to really be able to help people. So it's it's that line of, of humanitarian work. It's telling a story. And then what's the purpose behind it? What's the subject? What's the, the reason behind it? And, you know, in, in this case, it was, you know, a social business who are, are just doing amazing things with some women who have had some pretty hard, hard times. So photography can activate our senses and emotions. It can address important topics across bigger societal contexts. So when we mix these together, both the activation of our senses and emotions, but also the, the, the topics, the, the issues, the things around society that we come about with, then we can really create something that can affect people and create meaningful change. And that's something I strive for in all my images is to to create change. Um, it's not just to travel to Congo, travel to Nepal, travel to wherever, just to, to get some pretty photos. Um, you know, yes, you can do that. You can go on holiday and you can do that. Um, but for me, it's more. It's, it's really the purpose behind what I do, the places I go, the people I see, is to try and create a meaningful change. How can we help the situations that I'm being a witness to and I'm being a part of? And what does that mean? How do, how do I go about that? And how can we start a discussion? create awareness of the situation. Um, it can be selling products like in Nepal. It can be just creating awareness of the truth of, of the situation in Congo, what that actually means outside of the mainstream media, what is going on there and, and, and how can we share those, those truths. It's just a, a face that is one that I um, <laughs> always enjoy looking at. Um, this guy is just in the selling products on the streets um, of Nepal, um, were visiting a temple and he was there. So he could speak eight different languages and welcome all the tourists to sell, sell his goods and knickknacks and junk to everyone who came past on the way up to the, to the temple. And um, it just kind of, for me, this is what I look for in a, in a picture is something that creates a connection, um, an emotion, an expression, something that's out of the ordinary. Yes, you can get a smile, you can get you know, just a, a blank face. A lot of people do look quite stoic in their photos in, in other countries when they get, especially a white person come up to them to take a photo, you can get quite a blank expression. But trying to pull expressions like this out of people, how do we create something that's, that's engaging, that's captivating, I think that really can help, help share a story. Um, I spent some time in South Africa um, and I was working with an organization well, it was two organizations, actually. One was called An Uncommon Way. They were based out of America. They asked me to come with them to a trip to South Africa where we worked with Impact Africa. So Impact Africa is an organization in, based in Johannesburg, and they uh, work in different facets. They work in the slums around Johannesburg, helping um, find work for people. Um, they help with poverty, help with food. They have some schools that they run and they sponsor children in for schools. And they also have a baby rescue program where they rescue babies off the streets um, and have a safety, basically it's like a safety deposit box where people who don't want their babies anymore, instead of killing them and dumping them in the river, they can put them in this box in the village or in the, in the neighborhood. And once the baby gets put in there, an alarm rings and someone can come and get this baby and then they can take it. So these people can, instead of killing their child, they can have a way to hopefully um, give the child to someone who can then adopt or through their orphanage and baby care that they have, they can take care of that. So I worked with them and this is one of the stories that I, I told is this, this guy and his daughter, he was out at work all day um, he came home and often we hear about the negative, especially in places like that, the negative side of, of, of men, um, the abuse that 
that they can give, drinking problems, alcohol, drug problems, uh, violence, things like that. Um, but for me, this guy came home from working a you know a twelve hour shift in the field somewhere. Um, he came home and the love he had for his daughter just she ran to him, he ran to her, picked her up. You could tell he was tired, he was exhausted, he was dirty but he had all the time in the world for his little daughter. And to be able to show that in this picture, that there's this love there, there's an engagement there. And to be able to show that, you know, the male role model, we need to be showing stuff like this. We need to be showing images of hope. We need to be showing that it's not all negative. It's not just about someone who's abusing their family or, you know, is you know drunk all the time. But how can we show images that show a positive role model, a positive father figure in this, this area, which, you know, single single parents uh, everywhere um, in the in these slums in Johannesburg. Um, there's very little marriage, even um, people just sleep around and go everywhere. Um, and so there's not much commitment. So to find someone like this, who was committed to his family, to his wife and to his daughter um, was very special. Here's some more of just around the slums in Johannesburg. So once again, emotion is, is everything in storytelling for me. Um, how do I get these these stories told, what are we showing here? How am I showing that? This is life in the streets in, in these, these areas, you know, of kids having fun. They're just like my kids here. They're like your kids. They're like kids in the streets, pretty much anywhere in the world. They just want to have fun, right? They want to engage with their friends. They want to spend time together. And if you bring out a camera and give them the opportunity, they'll start acting off. They'll start showing off. They'll start being a bit crazy, a little bit wild. Um, and then you can get these images of, of these children having fun and showing that, you know, yes, they don't have much, but they are still full of joy, they're still full of hope. And, and that's the, the story that we're trying to portray through this. And then on the left there, you can see a couple of little images, just little short cuts. This is one of the girls who was working with us, who, of course, um, as most people do, when you fall in love with a, a, little, <laughs> a little child in a foreign country, um, you can see the little black hands on her white face. It was just this great contrast for me. Um, so just a moment picked out there. Um, and then the, the tear running down a dusty face um, is just also a very emotive image. It's an emotive portrait of, it, it can say so much. Um, yeah, so emotion is, is very strong. Um, trying to find these moments in chaos, in a lot of a lot of situations, it is quite chaotic. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of things going on. You're in a country where you don't necessarily speak the language. You can't necessarily communicate. How do you make sense of what's going on around you? So it's, it's trying to pull out these little moments, find these little little things that will help tell the story of these organisations, of the work they're doing, that can then help them to fundraise. It can help them to create awareness, to get more sponsors for their kids, to um, bring hope into a situation that is otherwise known as hopeless it's to show that hey these kids are the kids they're just like your kids they're like my kids um, so we can really do something with that um, i've done a lot of work in the drc um, and a lot of that work has been with women uh, and helping to empower women and to tell their stories and that's a uh, something I've, I've really fondly uh, grown into um, and I really enjoy um, is, is seeing and hearing the stories of these women who have been victims of, of conflict. Um, I don't know how much you know about, about Congo, but the last 20, 25 years, there has been a lot of violence, a lot of conflict, a lot of unrest in Congo. Um, upwards of 6 million people have died in that time in the conflict. There's multitudes of different um, militia groups active still in the country. And, you know, there's the, the, the statistics of, of rape and of violence and sexual violence through the war is, is horrible. It's, it's horrendous. I can't think of the statistics off the top of my head right now. Um, but as of, I think it was about 2017, they were saying that it was reported up to 1,400 rapes every day was reported in Congo, which is, is just hor horrific, really. And this is in a country where if you're raped, you're basically disowned from your family, from your village, um, because you are then tainted goods. No one wants you anymore. So unless you have to <laughs> have to report this, it goes unreported majority of the time. So the, the actual numbers must be astronomical. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Dennis McQuaigie. Um, he's a, a gynecologist working there. He won the Nobel Peace Prize about two years ago for his work with um, helping women who have been 
uh, majorly abused in, in the conflict in Congo. Um, so through that, I do a lot of work in these organizations with these people to tell their stories and to show hope that a lot of everyone there has has a negative story. You can't get away from that. Um, everyone has been hurt, either themselves or their family members in some way. Um, they're, they're directly connected to that. But you still see these smiles, the joy, the hope that is is there in people. And these women who have taken on themselves, they may not be educated, um, but they're getting the opportunity through different organizations that I have been working with to become educated, to learn to read, to write, to learn to sew, to learn to farm. And this has given them such, such an empowering um, spirit, I guess, to be able to move forwards in their lives, to be able to provide for the first time for their family, to be able to walk away from an abusive husband, to be able to help in their village, to make something special in their village. Um, and this is something that I, I, I just love to do, is to be able to tell these stories, to share these stories, to show these stories of, yes, there is pain there. It's not all pretty. It's not all wonderful. But at the same time, there's so much hope. There's so much beauty in a place like Congo. And we need to like follow that and, and really see the hope that's, that is in, in a place like Congo and, and everywhere else, really. Um, most places I go, that's something that I really look for. Majority of my photos that I take are, are positive stories. They're smiling people. They're trying to tell a, a hope-filled story, not a negative story. Um, I think media and organizations in the past have gone down that route of, you know, the crying, starving child um, to get fundraising um, and things like that, which it's, it's kind of a guilt method to get people to, to give to what they're doing. Um, definitely what, what I do is a lot more positive than that. It's to show a success. It's to show hope. It's to show people not to give up. That Congo, that Nepal, that Malawi, that Rwanda, these places, they're not somewhere to give up on. This is a place that has hope, that has beautiful people, and that with the right investment, with the right help, with the right care, these places can thrive and, and can be a very important part on the world stage. Um, so yeah, so empowering women is, is being very important to my work in Congo. Um, Congolese culture, I guess it's a bit like that throughout Africa, actually, from my experience, at least. I haven't been everywhere, of course, and maybe this is a broad statement, which isn't fully accurate, um, but women definitely do run the families. They do run the communities and the neighbourhoods. You know, you, you get the, the mamas sitting out there who know everything that's going on. They know everyone, where everyone's kid is, and, you know, it is that takes a village to to raise a child because they'll all discipline everyone's child. <laughs> you know, they'll all be there helping throughout that whole situation. Um, so to, to be able to create healthy families through healthy women um, who can then have a sustain a sustainable income um, can be taught. This lady on the right here, um, she's growing coffee beans. So they're the raw coffee beans just picked off the tree there. Um, it's always nice as a photographer when you get to a place to photograph someone. Her name's Bora. And uh, we arrived there and she was wearing this beautiful red and yellow dress and she picked the coffee beans off the tree, which were this beautiful red and yellow color, which matched perfectly her dress. You know, it's one of those things as a photographer, you, you know, you just love those moments. <laughs> you know, you couldn't have planned it any better if I picked out her wardrobe myself. It's just this beautiful connection with the clothing, with the, the, the coffee beans in her hand, contrasted with the green in the background just kind of worked really, really well. Um, so it's moments like that, which, which are beautiful. But at the end of the day, it's sharing the story. This is what she does. She had nothing. She comes from an uneducated village. She was lucky to work in the fields. And if she got paid, that was a bonus. Um, now she's, she learned how to read um, and she started a business. They gave, uh, this is through an organization called Women for Women International. Um, they give training in basic basic life skills really um, from hygiene right through reading and writing education um, and she's then developed her own coffee business with with a friend they've got a few coffee trees and they're now growing those selling those and she can send her kids to school um, she can buy her own house and she now has a future in a place that was very bleak previously um, so these are the stories of hope that I love to share and, and Congo is just, just full of them, um, full of amazing people, amazing women like these um, who are just doing pretty special things and, and to be able to meet them, hear their stories and share their stories is, is really, really special. For me, the strength of photography is its power that it has to evoke a sense of humanity. It helps us connect 
it helps us to see a human side to, to places and to people that we might not ever get to visit otherwise. Um, for me, I always, it, every situation I go into, I'm, I'm looking with compassion. I'm trying to, <laughs> you know, what's, what's the point of me taking photos? It's not to try and um, win awards. It's not to try and um, get attention for myself. It's to try and share the stories of the people I'm working with and to try and create awareness of the situations that I'm um, being around and then hopefully create some impact and some change through through my images. And if my images can do something like that and can help to create change and lasting change in a place, then that's where a success is. Um, but it is a challenge. It is a challenge when you're in a place to be looking through compassionate eyes all the time and not trying to find just the next pretty image and, and trying to make sure I'm connecting it and being genuine with the people that I'm working with. Um, if, if I lose that genuineness, if I'm not being compassionate with how I'm engaging with the people around me, then I'm going to lose the power and the impact that hopefully my images have. Um, I think there's a, a connection there that I make with every person that I photograph, whether I only connect with them for a couple of minutes and move on or whether I'm around them for weeks at a time. I always try and harbor a, a genuineness. I try and show who I am and also get to see who they are. I don't just want to come in and take your photo and run away and, and tell the story. I want to know who you are. I want to know what's happened in your life. I want to know what your dreams are, what your hope is for the future. And I think all that combined then can help me create a better image, a better portrait of who this person is and who these people are. Oh, what's going on here? Sorry. All right. Uh, a few years ago, I did a, um, an assignment up in the Himalayas and we went up to a little village called Langtang and um, it was all about giving a voice to the people up there. Um, it was in 2000, I think 2015, when the earthquake hit Nepal really badly, if you remember, um, and just was devastating to the whole country really, but up in the, the mountains, up where I was up in Langtang, entire villages wiped off the map. Um, and, you know, 95% of the village killed in, in a mudslide and, and stuff like that. So it's giving a voice to these people of hearing their story, giving a, an avenue, a place for voices to be heard, for stories to be shared, um, for the realities and difficulties of what life means. What, what is it like to live in the Himalayas? What's it like to be um, in a place where you're living next door to a wiped out village and you know, everything you've ever known, everyone you've ever known has just ceased to exist in a moment of time. Um, what, what does that look like? How does that impact people? And, and what are the stories that come out of a place like that? So it's, it's trying to capture stories. It's hearing people, it's listening to people. Um, and it's trying to mix an image. It, it is hard to tell a story that big. It's a grand story. Um, how do you get that through it through a single image? And this guy on the left, his name is Chimmy, and he lives in the village of Langtang. And um, the village was completely wiped out. And on his arm, you see, that's his brother. Um, his brother was killed in the, the mudslide that came through his village. He was actually visiting relatives at the time in a nearby village and um, came back to find his whole family, his whole house, everything just gone. Um, his brother was his best friend and his closest friend and everything. So he got this tattoo um, a couple of weeks after the landslide happened to always remember his brother. Um, and these are the sort of stories. What, what is it that people go through? How do people get through a moment like that? How do you survive? How do you not just survive? How do you keep going on? What makes you want to stay in that place where you have all these memories? Um, and and the, it's these things. It's his brother. It's the memory of his brother. It's been close to where his brother was. And, you know, knowing that his brother wants him to continue on doing what he was doing. Um, so it's telling these stories of, of people, of the people I meet, the people that are there that we get to engage with um, in a place that, you know, not many people get to get to. And most people come through on a trek and they'll come in, they'll eat, they'll sleep, they'll get up the next day and they'll pass on. And, and there's very little besides a service offered. Um, so to be able to come in and actually engage and, and talk to and get to know people a little bit and open, open up to them and have them open up in return to me to be able to share some of these stories and, and show what's, 
what life is like in, in these little villages in the Himalayas. These are funeral pyres. Um, this is in Kathmandu itself. And so you can see on the right, the bodies are being prepared um, to be burnt. And on the left, that they are, um, it's a crematorium. So this is where the, the bodies are being cremated and then the ashes get dumped into the river and get washed away in this holy river. Um, very confronting. <laughs> it's a confronting place to be. Um, the smells, the sights, the sounds of it all is, is very um, in your face. It's very real. I guess in, in the Western world and here in Australia, we're very separated from death in that way. Um, you don't see scenes like this. And it was one thing I, I wanted to show um, a little bit of that. What's, what's this actually like? And, and trying to get that smokiness that, you know, over that whole area has this heavy smell, this smoky, like this is all day, every day. There's just these things just, just going on, these fires burning. Um, so trying to show the reality of that, some of the grief of the family, some of the, um, the belief system of, you know, why these are done this way. You know, there's certain areas, there's certain places this can only be performed and by certain, certain people from their faith who can perform these, um, these rites and these rituals to get the people on into the next step of their uh, afterlife, as, as they would say in, in Hinduism. Um, and yeah, so just trying to capture some of these moments um, is, is something that helps me to tell the story of, of the people of Nepal, of, of this place, of this country that you know, I can hopefully show to people who haven't been there um, and you can get a bit of an idea of, of what it's like. Just a few more faces of people that we met um, along the way. And um, yeah, I, I just love faces. I love people. Uh, I love capturing the ev everyone is different. I don't know really any of you. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure what you like to photograph and, and how you get into photography and and what it really means to you and, and what you get out of photography. But for me, it's, it's these moments of, of meeting new people, um, telling their story. Everyone for me has an interesting story. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's in some little village in Congo or whether it's here in Adelaide. Um, if you take the time to listen to someone, if you take the time to get to know somebody, there's a story there that that, that can be told and can be interesting. And um, that's something that I, I really try and, and find is, is that story in people. You know, how, how can I connect to you? How can I hear your story? I, I want to know about what makes you tick, who you are, what are your dreams for the future? How did you grow up? Where did you grow up? What's life to you? Um, what's your family like? You know, these, these things, I, I think we can always find an interesting story in anyone around us. Um, so it's, it's pretty special to be able to do that wherever I am. Right now, that's here in Adelaide and photographing people here. And when I get the opportunity, it's, it's other places all over the world as well. Just a couple more little shots from, from Nepal here. Um, just moments of, of people, which I, I tried to pick these out specifically because I don't know if anyone's been to Kathmandu um, or India is, is a similar thing. It's just busy. It's noisy. It's busy. It's visually just full on. <laughs> the colours, the sights, the sounds, everything is always there. Um, so trying to get these little moments of solitude, these moments of quiet in a place that seems to be always going um, was a bit of a goal of mine there to try and bring that out through some of these images. Just the night sky up in the Himalayas. If anyone likes taking landscapes and star photos, um, once you get up to about 16,000 feet in the Himalayas, there's very little light pollution <laughs> and the stars look spectacular. So if, if that's your thing, um, when things open up and you get the opportunity, go to Nepal and, and do a little trek and you'll find some of the most amazing skies that you could imagine. All right. Um, another big part of what I do in Congo revolves around education. Um, and so I have photographed different schools and different teachers, different students um, to help bring awareness to what a school looks like in Congo. So this is in the city of Bukavu and this is a school. Um, there's no paper, the kids don't have books. Each kid has their own little chalkboard that they write on at the end of the lesson, they rub it off or you know, when they finish that line, they rub it off and they start again. So they have nothing to look back on. They have nothing they can just, um, yeah, go back and review at night time. This is what they have. Um, so they they work hard with what they have. The teachers are very 
very underpaid. Um, and it really is a, a devotion of love for this, their students, for them to be able to even work and do what they're doing. Um, but yeah, education is so key to the future of places like Congo. Um, so it's something that I, I love to be able to highlight, to show and to be able to, to bring, because there's also something everyone here, we've all been to school, right? We all, all have an understanding of what school is and how school works and, and what it has done for us. And to be able to see a school in a place like Congo in these sort of situations is, is something that we can automatically connect with. It's a connection point that we can make and see, wow, I remember the chalkboards at my school, but they weren't like that. You know, I remember my teacher at my school and all this. Um, and then even looking at the board there, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, they're learning this in French. Um, it's, it's simple multiplication, right? I, I remember doing multiplication at school. And, you know, so it's, it's this, this connection point with the audience that helps to, to really bring an awareness um, and also helps, it, it's a connection. It's, it's what makes people think, wow, oh, that, that resonates with me. That means something to me. Here's a couple of the boys on the little chalkboards writing out their, I think they were doing their letters at that day. They were writing out their letters on the boards. Um, it's a, pretty cool experience uh, on the left here is the principal of the school um, so you can see it's just made out of wood dirt ground um, and then on the right is some of the kids in the school and, and the village area where it's in so this is some some of the realities of congo you know you, you want those close-up pictures of the kids drawing you want to show that the bigger picture of, of where this place is of of the teachers who devote their lives to education in a place where you know they're not getting rich off this <laughs> you know they, they're really giving of themselves to be able to to educate these kids and, and give these kids the hope and, and hopefully bring a, a real positive future to the to the congo so a lot of what i do there are always stories there's facts there's information when i go to congo when i go to nepal when i'm in south africa but it's not about just regurgitating facts it's not about hearing something finding something on on Instagram or on Google, and then going back to tell them, just, just to replicate that through a picture. Um, a lot of it is figuring out the point behind these, these stories, the, the, the facts, what's going on, but why, you know, what's the story here? What does it mean? And more importantly, why does it matter? You know, sharing these stories of, of kids going to school in Congo, why, why does that matter? You know, um, and, and that's the big thing for me is trying to show that then through an image that it's so important that if, if Congo wants to progress, if Congo wants to move forwards, then educating the younger generation is vital. Um, if they want to have jobs, if they want to be able to grow to the international market and, and, and find their place in the world, then they need to be educated. And that goes right through the whole system from you know politics to medicine to shopkeeping to engineers, these people can only flourish in Congo through a, through a healthy education system. So it's finding out these facts. What are the statistics to Congo? Like, you know, 50% of the population of Congo is under the age of 15. So that's a very, very young population. Um, and this is the chance for them to now be educated. And as they grow up, they will extend. And, and this is the, really the future. So the younger generation is vital to the future of Congo. But that's just a statistic, right? It's just a, a, a fact, a statistic, a, a number. But to really put a face to that of a child studying, and this is his future, this is what he can do. He is the future of Congo. And to be able to show that through an image is quite important. Another part of, of what I see my, my, my work involves is preserving culture. Um, it's showcasing parts of the world that um, a lot of us will never get to see and other parts of the world that are disappearing. Things, methods of doing things, ways that we go about things, cultural things that are just disappearing as the world opens up, you know, as the international markets come in, as, as it's cheaper and easier to buy something from China than it is to make it yourself. Um, so it's preserving some of this history, some of these things. I, I spent some time in Georgia. Um, for those of you who don't know where Georgia is, it's surrounded by sort of Azerbaijan, um, Armenia, Georgia, and then Russia is up above it. Um, and I spent some with an organization called Re Rewoven. So Rewoven um, makes hand-woven Aziri rugs. 
in Georgia. Um, so I spent some time in their village in, with these people and we just followed the whole process from here, the shepherds up in the mountains in the Caucasus. It's the middle of summer. So down on the plains, it's 45 degrees and hot. So they move all their sheep up to the mountains and where at nighttime it can still drop below below freezing um, but there's grass up there there's feed for there so every year they walk with a flock of sheep up to the mountains and live up in the, the mountains for the for the whole of the summer before moving back because it gets too cold to survive up there in winter so it's then moved back to the plains back to your family um, and then there they shear their sheep of course and, and just following that whole process of of shepherds with their sheep right through to the finished making of rugs so here you can see one of the Aziri rugs hanging up. So this one's just been finished. Um, it's been washed and it's out to dry. Um, so these are the rugs that they're making. So these are all very traditional patterns. Each one has tells a story. It's very much storytelling through their rug weaving. Um, every aspect of the, of the rug, every symbol, every sign, every colour um, helps to tell a story of, of who they are. A lot of them very traditional and very old. Um, and they still sort of recreate these um, patterns, these images. Um, in their rugs now. Um, here on the left is the cleaning of the wall. So once it's been shorn, they take it down to the river and they have, this is actually, it's just a um, old spring mattress that they put upside down in the rivers to stop the wool from washing away. And they put the wool in the, the mattress spring thing. So the river can come through and wash any dirt and stuff away. And the, and the women, there's two of them to every one of these. There's about six of them down the riverbank and they beat it with sticks to get all the dirt out and to clean the walls. So this is the process of cleaning the wall before they start weaving it into the rug. Um, it's very time consuming. It's very interesting. I, when I first saw it, I'm like, what, what on earth are they doing? This is something that's not done anymore. You know, you have machines to do with this kind of thing. So to see this whole process that's been done and it's probably been done the same way for thousands of years. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting thing. And it's just such an honor to be able to capture that, um, the whole process and document this process of something that is dying out, you know, it is really the only older generation that, you, that, that do this now. And even the weavers themselves are all older ladies. Um, the younger generation is not interested because, you know, by the end of the day, to sell one of these rugs, you have to sell it for thousands of dollars to make your money back because it's so labor intensive. And you can go and buy one in the markets in Georgia that's being made in China for you know a hundred dollars. So it's this: how can we preserve this? How can we continue to make this things a beauty? Um, so the organisation Rewoven actually sells these internationally and then does get into that artisan type of market um, where people do want to buy an actual a proper handmade product and not just a, a factory made thing. Um, so it then does bring a living wage back into the village, where hopefully the whole the the hope is that people will see there is money to be made in this if we're doing it right um, and it will keep these traditions alive and, and these methods of making things alive. Um, so here's, this is Jeanette, she's, she was 83, um, she's the matriarch of the family, so she really had her finger in everything going on, you know, every, every rug that was being woven, every loom that was being um, strung up, every bit of wool that was being washed she would sort of oversee and she was very much the the leader of the family and, and running the whole show and just a bit more this is just the village life you know shepherd life camp up in up in the hills up in the mountains they just it's tense it's nomadic because they move with the flocks as they run out of of grazing ground they'll up the whole camp and move on again and then set up camp again so it was a very special time i got to spend a night up there in the shepherd's tents with these guys um, and it was just a very very powerful time so i'd just like to finish off this is the my ongoing project i'm working on in congo um, it's called kitoka oyo and kitoka oyo in lingala which is a language there in congo means this beauty um, so the whole point of our, our project, I work closely with a, a guy, his name's Papi. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, he's Congolese. He lives in Germany now. But we were looking at, and we've worked in Congo quite a bit together. And I remember sitting down one day and we Google searched Congo in the news. And it took us about four or five pages of articles before something positive came up. Everything was negative about war, about conflict, about violence, about rape, about something. And we're like, wow, this, this is horrible. This isn't the reality of Congo. Yes, that's there. 
but there's so much hope in Congo. There's so much beauty in Congo. So through this beauty or Kitoka Oyo, we aim to show the beauty that is there, finding these people, finding stories of hope and to bring hope to people. So we're gonna make a documentary. We're in the process of making a documentary and putting a photo book together um, to showcase stories of hope. We have a bunch of ambassadors of just wonderful people that we've met in Congo um, who are just there to, to share their story of, of what they're doing, of how they're bringing change. Um, we've got artists, we've got politicians, we've got... Um, chefs we've got doctors it's all part of our, our project and and to really show that there is such hope in, in congo that we shouldn't give up on this place um that there's just immense beauty in congo and um, we really want to show that to the world that the world can see this place as as a place not to give up on but a place that we can believe in that we can invest in that we can see a, a positive future for um yeah so it's just some of my pictures for that that are really helping to to show a positive light on on what congo is some more of our faces here so this is dr elodie down on the right there um she's a, a female doctor in bukavu in chai hospital and um very inspirational like most of the doctors there barely earn a wage um she she dedicates a lot of her time just donates it to being there um she's a beautiful woman this beautiful big smile um and then when she gets into surgery it's just just this change from this smiley happy person to the very serious and very like it was, it was pretty special to see um, so she's one of our ambassadors um and just you know people it's faces in congo what we're trying to show um trying to show hope and um what better way to do that than with a, a beautiful face a smiling face in the markets kids on the street um and what that looks like um and here is this is one of our ambassadors as well marula so marula is actually he was voted in the paris peace forum um two years ago is one of the 30 most influential young people in the world cli uh, combating climate change. So he has um, started his own uh, recycled charcoal business. So these briquettes he has in his hand, every morning him and his team of about five people, they get up and go through the town, go through his area, and with their truck, they collect garbage off the streets. They pick it up off the streets. They collect it from schools. Um, they, they then filter that out to what's organic and what they can actually use. Um, and then they make these charcoal briquettes out of the trash that they pick up from the streets. So not only you know are they creating a, a cleaner burning, uh, cheaper, a more efficient fuel, but it's also eliminating the trash problem in the in the neighborhood as well. Um, so much to the extent that this is working so well, um, combating climate change, combating deforestation, and combating the, uh, the, the the garbage problem in his village, in his city. Um, that yeah. That, so the Paris Peace Forum said he was one of the the thirty young thirty people under thirty most combating climate change in the world. Um, so from a little place in Congo, that's pretty special. An amazing guy always has new initiatives new plans going on and these are the stories that we're trying to show that you know congolese people are smart congolese people are hard workers and we want to highlight that and and i this is this is what i i love to take photos for you know is sharing these sort of stories um and this is what's going to bring change to not only congo but throughout africa and the world is people like marula who really have a passion for the people around him bettering his community um, and that's something that we all, all need to do is better our community, whatever that community is, whether it's the place we live, whether it's the photo clubs that we're a part of, whether it's the work we do online, um, our business, our office, we all have a community around us and how, how do we better it? And, and Marula really inspired me in the way of, you know, what am I doing to better my community? What am I doing to give back to my community? And um, that's part of what Kitoka Oyo as our project is, is really showing these stories and trying to inspire people to see you know, not only what is possible in Congo, but what is possible in themselves and in, in their own communities as well. It's just a few more faces and a few more images from Kotokoyo from Congo. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty special place. And uh, I obviously, if you haven't picked up, I'm quite passionate about, <laughs> about Congo and have, have a great love for this place. Yeah. And um, that's kind of the end of my little presentation. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so much to ask. Um, <laughs> well, at this point, I'd like to invite everyone to unmute themselves if they have a question um, and come on in, as it were. 
uh, to the conversation. Uh, I have got, I could spend probably the next hour asking you questions to be quite honest, um, <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm going to open it up um, to everyone else. First of all, anyone have a, a question you'd like to ask? Oh, the silence oh. is deafening. Come on, oh. <laughs> go on, go on, Oh, I, oh, wow, Ryan, your no. vote is just so wonderful and so evocative. You really, you really capture people so well. I guess my one question, I don't even know if you can answer it, is how do you, how do you start? <laughs> do you just walk up to someone out of the street and say, hi, I want to take your photo? Or where do you start? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, actually, it is. It's, it's, oh, um, God. Most, most of my actually assignments I work on, I have people on the ground already. I'm working with organizations um, that are embedded locally. They have the friendships, they have connections, they have trust that's been built over years. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful. Like in Congo, I have a great team of, of local Congolese people that every time I go back with, I'm working with them. And so then when we go to villages, when we go places, they already have the trust and they already have connections and friendships. Right. Um, so that really speeds up the process. It's still something, I, for me personally, I still need to make a connection with someone I'm photographing. So I think that's what brings out a genuine photograph, mm. um, genuine expression, a real truth to their story comes through relationship. Um, but to be able to fast forward through you know, the first <laughs> however many weeks that would take to get to even the place of being able to communicate with someone and have them open up to in a place where they already are aware that I'm coming, they have someone vouch for me that they trust and we can get to a, a deeper level a much quicker, yeah. um, really makes all the difference. That's, that's one of the questions I was going to actually ask you about conditions. I mean, I mean, obviously, um, going into some of these areas um, where even from a religious standpoint, um, you know, you speaking to a woman uh, or having, or being left alone with a woman or in the same room with, in some certain situations, um, that in itself needs some sort of permissions going on. That's something, obviously, your your team or your group that's doing the pre-work mm -hmm. sorts that out, I assume. Is that yes, right? yes, very much. Okay. Um, every organization that I'm working with, they, we have to get, of course, permission. Um, there's releases signed, to make sure we can use the, the images, the, the footage that we do with interviews and stuff like that. Um, so we, we definitely need to make sure we cover all that. The last thing we want to do is, is hinder any of the work going on by taking advantage of someone in a, in a poor situation. Um, it's something I, very, I, I look very strongly at when I'm taking my photos. Mm -hmm. Is this something I would be happy to have my photo taken of? Um, if, it, if it's a situation or a, an area where I wouldn't like to be photographed in that, then I will think twice before taking that photograph. Um, so it's there, there is a line there. I'm not a photojournalist, so I'm not looking for these moments of, of destitution of, of, you know, of people in pain. Um, that's not something that I'm, I'm seeking out. I really am trying to seek out a deeper story. And that generally for me comes through relationship and, and through the relationship with the people that, that work with these people. Um, and then it's to share a hope-filled story or at least a story that um, shows people in a dignified light um, in a way that they would be happy and proud to see themselves being represented. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, one of the questions, sorry, anyone else with a question at this stage? <laughs> okay. Um, one of the questions I have on my list here of many um, is safety. You know, um, as a photographer working uh, commercially over here, I'm conscious. Um, I'm, there's a lot of stories coming out of the states where photog you know photographers are being targeted and mm -hmm. being followed and so on and so forth. Um, being in uh, the chaos, in your words, uh, if somebody some of these places, um, are you ever concerned about your safety? At times, yes, I've had a few moments that have been a little um, uncertain. Um, and once again, for me, I'm, I'm very thankful that in those moments, I've had great people around me, um, people who I just trust wholeheartedly. And I, I take their word um, for things. When they say it's time to go, it's time to go. Um, when they say it's time to run, it's time to run. Um, so it's, it's those sort of moments. It's, it's, it's having those people around me who are aware of, of the local situation, of the local, the nuances that as a foreigner, as someone who's not from the area, that you just can't pick up these nuances. So um, I've, I've learned to just be very, very trusting of the people I'm around um, and making sure that I'm, you know, 
I, I, I'm not going to be put myself in a place where I'm going to risk something just for an image at this stage. Um, that might come, that might happen sometime. I don't know. It's, it hasn't hasn't been a, a, a really a choice for me to have to make yet, but um, it's very much and and even say with equipment and stuff, I do have a lot of a lot of money's worth of equipment when I travel. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, like that's a tool, right? And I use that to get an image. If I don't have it with me, I don't get the images. So mm. worst case scenario is someone steals all that, then that is replaceable. Um, mm. It's not a mm. great situation. I wouldn't want that to happen. And it would still cost me a, a fair bit <laughs> in, mm. in replacing that. But it, it's, it's those situations where, you know, um, you can sort of, as well as possible, um, mm. try and be smart, be wise, and um, hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, one of the things which, obviously, as a, a working photographer, um, you have your times where your drive is low. You know, as a as any as if anybody in any profession. Um, me listening to you going through a lot of what you do just in the Congo alone. Um, surely that must there must be testing times for you as an individual how do you find, how do you work through that yeah um <laughs> very good question <laughs> it's something i think it's just the i guess a drive that i have like mm. i said earlier it's, it's about the humanity it's about mm. realizing that people are people everywhere in the world um and to be at a I kind of see what I do. I, I'm very honoured to get to do what I do. And I feel privileged to be able to get to do what I do. And um, on those days when things do suck, you know, when I've been yeah. up for 18 hours for the last four days straight working and carrying my camera and doing things and I'm tired. And I know that I have another four days ahead of me before I get to go home or whatever this is. I haven't seen my family for weeks. Um, it's those moments that I try and think about that, you know, that, well, what's the situation of the people that I'm actually talking with here and where they come from. And um, I, I really am privileged to get to do what I do. And at the end of the day, if I, I don't get much sleep for a few weeks or I don't get to see my family for a couple of weeks, that's a, a, a small price to pay, I think, for the, the privilege of getting to do what I, I, I get to do. But it's, it definitely isn't always easy. And there are, are times where it is a struggle. Um, definitely, I don't want to to say that and um some of the stories and and things i have experienced especially in congo um have been quite confronting and the things that i have had to work through myself um, afterwards as well i'm um, just hearing the stories of of what what happens in in a conflict situation like that and um you know hearing what it's what humans are capable of doing to each other um mm. and and the effects of that on people on families on children on on the community around them um, has been very, very challenging at times to be able to um, disengage, I guess, some of that. And often on at the time when I'm taking photos, I do almost just disengage from the realities of what's going on or of the stories that I'm hearing to capture the, the, the image. Um, but then at some stage that comes back, right? Whether it's that night or, you know, over the next few days or on the plane ride home or you know, months later sitting at home, um, mm -hmm. These, these stories, the things you've heard, you can't unhear, right? And um, some of them are very confronting and trying to deal with that, what what that, the realities of that, you know, and, and trying to put that in some kind of context and how to, um, yeah, how, how to deal with that and cope with that, I think is, is something that I'm still kind of working through. I have a great support base around me. I have a wonderful wife who's very helpful in that as well um, and, and good friends around me who, you know, who help me through through that as well. Mm. I mean, mm. obviously, the first first thing that comes to my mind when you started talking about Congo was that um, it, it is very, very confronting. Just what you said is confronting. For what you have seen, um, I can't even imagine, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and for, for you to digest that and, like you say, bring that home and um, be able to handle it and still going back for more, uh, you know, my hat comes off to you. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent job being done, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, I've thrown it around the table. Anybody want to have a, a, a chat, say anything on, online? I, no? know, I noticed that some of your okay. images of Nepal, the yep. interior yep. ones, were very like traditional images uh, in terms of dark backgrounds and the, the subjects were highlighted. 
some of the ones you had there of Georgia and a couple of latter ones there of um, the Congo were much different in terms of the style that you used. Is there any, this mean your style has changed over time or you Yeah. Like, 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 like the ones of Georgia were very much undersaturated and mm -hmm. almost like a, an old style um, print type version rather than what you'd normally see in later. Yeah, I think definitely my, my, my style has um, changed over the years for sure. Um, I think the way I, I edit images, uh, even the way I capture images now has, has changed. Um, I think that's just a natural progression of, of who I am as I develop, as I, I grow more and as I learn more. And I think that's a, a, a good thing. <laughs> um, but also a lot of it is very um, specific to the environment and the, the situation I'm, I'm around um, and what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, some clients have a certain look or a certain feel that they want as well. Um, so they can communicate that to me before we go into it. They might have already like a corporate feel, a corporate, you know, um, color palette and design to their work and, and, and a look that they've used before. And so that's something they kind of want to match. They don't want everything to look very different than things they've already got in their, their content libraries. Um, so it's, it's a bit of trying to, to match that a little bit. Um, and sometimes I just see something and, and shoot it and it comes out that way. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I, I like experimenting. I like trying with different things as well. Um, so you'll be there and think, oh, let's just do this and, and go from something that, you know, maybe uh, you've gone through a whole whole series of work that's been quite desaturated and quite, quite moody and then go to something that's very high key and very bright and very colourful. Um, I know for the Kotoko Oyo project we're working on, it has been a brighter and more colourful project. Yeah. Um, and that comes along with the whole feeling of hope that we're trying to portray, um, mm -hmm. showing beauty showing showing this that sort of a heavy desaturated feel isn't really going to work in that context it's not going to portray the message that we want just visually so it's really trying to show and and use every tool that we've got right i, I don't want to sort of pigeon my hole myself into one one style i think i do definitely have a style that if you, if you look through my my website or my instagram or something like that you will see a, basically a consistent style through that but i think there is definitely some nuances to that um, which goes outside my norm, but still, I think, says it's, it's still one of my, my images. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the moment, the situation um, definitely sort of dictates what I go for in an image as well and, and what I try and achieve. Most often when I take an image, I already have a sort of a finished product in my mind, I guess. Of, of when I'm taking a, a, you know, take a portrait, I can kind of already see what I will probably want this finished portrait to look like. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in all honesty, that changes day to day. I can go to the same place with the same person the, the next day and capture something completely different. Um, so depending on my mood and, and where I'm at, um, if I have that flexibility, depending on the assignment to just be able to shoot the things that I want to shoot um, and shoot what I see is, is pretty, that's really the dream assignment is when you just get told, just, just go here and capture this and make pretty images. Um, then that's, that's really quite the dream to be able to go and do that. But other, other times you don't have that flexibility. So you sort of create the images around the, the requirements of the job and um, go from there. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> so do you do jobs in Australia as well or just or mainly? Yep. Um, well, now I'm, I've been forced to. So we were living overseas, <laughs> actually. Um, we were in Ukraine for the last four and a half years. Um, and as of sort of May this year, we came back because I couldn't travel. Um, not being able to travel meant I couldn't work. Um, and so we're stuck at home. We were basically stayed in our apartment for, you know, the best part of what, 12, 18 months or something um, under quite strong lockdown. And you know, there was a lot of COVID where we were. So we were being very careful not to get out. And it just got to the stage where there was no end in sight. Um, we had planned to move to Germany, um, but the borders were shut and Germany wasn't much better really as far as COVID goes and so we made the decision as a family to move back home um, back here to Adelaide so we've only sort of been back here since May um, but yeah definitely I'm, I'm, I'm working here commercially at the moment trying to pick up bits and pieces of, of whatever I can really to make ends meet at this point in time um, but you know I, I'm still sort of very much on the storytelling sort of um, basis of what, what I'm looking for I've just done 
uh, recently completed a job for Bedford Industries, which is a, a company here in South Australia that uh, manages employment for disabled people. Um, so mm. doing a lot of that. So shooting in the factory where they have it all set up for, for um, packaging and um, putting labels on things, doing flat pack stuff for Bunnings and stuff like that. So it's, it's all set up for, for disabled people to go in and to be able to, to, to work and, and find employment there. So these are the sort of things I'm looking for here. It's once again, it's that storytelling, it's that humanity, it's trying to showcase positive sides of, of life and not just sort of commercial things. Mm. Thank you. Any other can questions ask, around the table? Yeah, yes. mate, yes, can sorry. I ask what's your favourite lens to you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really depends on what I'm doing. Um, my kit, I, I pretty much take everywhere. So I shoot Nikon primarily. Mm -hmm. um, I, my D8. <laughs> 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 so the, the D850 is my primary camera. Um, and then yes. <laughs> it's a good one. I love it. Uh, it's it's treated me very well. Um, so twenty four to seventy two point eight is sort of my go to. Mm. It's just a, a good mm. a good focal length for me. I have mm. the seventy to two hundred, which I do enjoy, um, depending what I I'm use what I'm shooting. It doesn't mm. go on every trip with me because it is big and it is heavy, and mm. it has limited uses on a lot of things. A lot of the shots I do, I'm getting up close to people. I'm mm. you know like like this. I want to shoot wide. I want to show environment. I want to show the situation around me and I don't want to be standing back across the street um, mm. photographing people. I want to be up there. I want to be connecting with someone on a, on a sort of a real natural level. And that mm. sort of means something, something wider. Um, mm. And then my 50, 51.4 I shoot with as well. Um, it's just yeah. great. It's a small lens. It's a cheap lens. It's tack <laughs> sharp. You can get that very, you know, out of focus background at 1.4. Um, it's just a, a, a great lens and it's very unobtrusive. If it's, I'm going somewhere that is a bit more questionable, um, that might not be quite so safe. It's it's smaller. It, it doesn't stand out as much and it makes it look a bit more like a, you know, just a holiday camera rather than a, mm -hmm. a big mm -hmm. thing with a big camera on it, you know. So mm -hmm. it does depend, but they're, they're my primary lenses that I, I use. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Cover me for most things I do. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, no worries. Um, I, I, I knew I knew I like I like this man. 850, 850, 24, 70, Oh my gosh, you're talking about my kit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions around the table? Oh, I was just wondering, um, with the processing of the photos, do you, do you keep them all until you get back to a base somewhere or do you? process them every day or um it depends on the situation it depends where i am i don't always take a computer with me um and so in those situations i just keep everything on cards and um when i get home it's just a big mass dump down <laughs> like in the himalayas like i was so stretched for weight because we're, we're trekking for 10 days and i had to carry everyone on the trek had to carry their clothes and everything with them and then on top of that i had all my camera gear so i was trying to get as as light as possible i already had an extra 15 kilos on everyone else because of camera gear you know so it's just didn't take a camera a, a laptop because it's just too much work um, where I can say in Congo, in other places, Malawi, other places that I work, I do have a camera and it's a, a, a laptop with me. I do try and download the end of every day um, and then even do some basic um, just sorting um, where, where possible back up onto multiple drives. So I have multiple mm -hmm. copies of everything. And then if I can, I'll sit down that night, have a drink, have some food and um, just go through and, and sort of get rid of any you know, my, my system, I just use the star star rating system through Lightroom generally and um, go through and give anything a one that's, that might be possibly usable, mm. one star. And then that might be as far as I get. If, if possible, I'll go through to a two star and anything that's good um, that I sort of flick through. I don't take a lot of time at this stage and I'll go through it all again when I get home anyway. Um, but go through and anything that I think, yeah, this is actually something I'll use, not just you know, it's sharp and there's, you know, ex no blinking eyes or anything like that. I just get rid of that stuff. Um, but anything I might actually use, I'll sort of two star. And depending where I am, what I'm doing, often I'll um, be documenting bits and pieces of my trip through uh, Instagram and social media as well. So it might be each night, go through and try and pick out a, a hero image um, and just do a quick little edit up on that and have something to post to Instagram each day. Um, but that once again depends on how tired I am and how uh, <laughs> how much I feel like doing that. And 
if, if possible, I at least try and download and back up. So I have two copies of everything from every day. Um, and that's, that's kind of the minimum I try and do. And then any more I can do on top of that is, is good. Thank you. Um, any others? Just out of no? curiosity, how do you protect your gear when you are traveling in really extreme um, climates? You know, like the humidity, moisture, that sort of thing. Yeah. Cold. I don't generally um, do too much. If it's <laughs> raining, I'd put a like a rain bag over my, yeah. my backpack. Um, but outside of that, I find all my gear, my nightgown gear has been pretty, pretty spectacular. I've, I've used it from Gosh. minus 30s to, you know, plus 50s and haven't had a problem. So wow. you know, mm. it's, it's one of those things. I just kind of trust the gear to do what it's made to do and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hope it does and haven't had a problem yet. So, you know, I just, um, you know, of yeah. course I try and like maintain it and, you know, not change lenses when it's dusty and stuff, which, yes. you know, yeah. in Congo and Africa, that is hard trying to find a place that isn't too dusty, but it's like not sit in the back of a moving land cruiser and uh, try and change lenses because that's just going to end up with dust all over my sensor, you know, so yeah. trying to be smart with things like that. Um, if it gets wet out in the rain, then dry it off as soon as I can. But, you know, I don't, I don't baby it. I don't like not shoot because it's raining outside. You know, I might try and put a plastic bag over it where possible. Um, if not, I don't really take that much, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's just, you know, I just, just use it. It's, it's a tool and I'll just use it and get what I can. And, if something bad goes wrong, then I'll deal with it when it does, you know, and yeah. hopefully so far it hasn't. I always have a, a backup camera with me as well. So I take two cameras from my old, I use a D800E as my um, backup camera. Um, so, and so Ryan, 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 you haven't got to say anything. You just, all you should have answered to is that you're shooting with a Nikon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't need any more than that. No, no more than that. <laughs> no, thank you, no, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I, got a, I got a couple of things for you. Um, obviously, look, from two things, from an observation point of view, photographer wise, um, you know, I go to shoot a, a headshot for a client. I really don't get into the, um, you know, deep and meaningfuls about who they are, what they are. I just simply want to look at their face and make sure I've got yep. it right for the client. And that, that's my job, you know. Yep. Um, uh, listening to you, it, it's such an inspiration to think about, hang on a minute. You know, if, if I was going into that situation, I would have the time to sit there, have a coffee, understand a little bit more about them so as to get more from them. And that's a lovely thing to be. I, have. I suppose the, the difference is in what you do in order to get the best out of it for where you're doing it. You're going to have to go that way. Right. Yeah. Whereas for me, I just got to show up. You know, show, show up, light, light, light them, and take the shot. And exactly. So makes, and and with headshots like that, with commercial headshots, they they, don't, they want to be out of there as soon as they can. That's and right. so yeah. the longer you yeah. talk to them, the more pissed off they're going to get and the worse the photo is going to be. Right? Ah. So like, you kind of need to <laughs> true. pick true. your audience. True. And I definitely true. have moments all over the world where people, mm. I need to photograph this person and they don't want to be photographed. Mm. So it's just a get in, mm. get it done, mm. get out. Like not everything is, is a full-on relationship. There are people who don't want to talk to me. There's people who refuse to have the photo taken. That's mm. the reality of it. Um, so it's, it's really picking that moment. Like, you know, I do headshots and stuff here as well. It's the same thing. You get in, you get into a law firm and do a bunch of headshots and they just oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. you know they don't to even to, get yeah. them to rock up is is hard <laughs> yeah. enough you know they don't want to talk they don't want to share their life story they don't want to do anything so to try Very and true. pull an expression out of them or something you know it's it's hard, it's it's hard. hard. Yeah. so mm. it's really just the the mm. moments pick pick the moment and uh, pick the battle and yeah. um, mm -hmm. where possible in in at least in this situation for me this sort of stuff i shoot it it does tend towards a better image when I can have a relationship with people, but it doesn't always happen. And some of my favorite images have been a walk in the room, a quick snap and leave again. And it just, just happened to, to get a great shot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just one of those things. It hasn't taken time. It hasn't taken building a trust or relationship. It's just been one mm -hmm. of those walk in. It's a, it's a beautiful scene. The light just happens to be falling right. The person sitting right. The colors <laughs> all work. And just get the trust, you know? So <laughs> some of it is, is just luck. <laughs> Um, my, my last question, I think, um, and there's nobody else asking questions at this stage, social media, obviously we've both grown up in a, in a light world where social media is, is king. Um, and so obviously playing a heavy role, especially with um, media, uh, photographic media or video media, it doesn't really matter. How has that been impacting you? Um, for me, it's been great, actually. Like a lot of my um, contacts, a lot of my assignments have come through social media. 
um, people mm -hmm. seeing my work and then contacting me saying, oh, we would like you, you know, would you be willing to do, come here or to shoot this sort of stuff? Or we love what you're doing. Can we talk to you about having, you know, getting something mm -hmm. like that? So for me, social media has been one of my primary um, ways of promoting my work and of picking mm -hmm. up assignments. Um, so mm -hmm. that's been good. It is definitely work um, mm -hmm. to try and be consistent on social media, to try and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know if you've, you've seen my social media, but it's not just images. I, I definitely try and write a bit of a caption and try and mm. tell a story, uh, give a bit of background to each image that I post. I, I don't want to just, mm. you know, put it up there. So I try and connect to it, it with organizations that I'm working with and things like that. Um, so mm. it is time consuming. Um, mm. And so it's one of those things that it's, I, I see it, it's just part of my business now um mm. it's, it's mm. part of what i do you know i have to do my mm. taxes i have to do my my bookkeeping <laughs> i have to do this stuff and it's just you know social media some days i love it and i want to do it other days it's like mm. i just have to do it so i'll sit down and i'll you know just push through as we all do i'm sure the business mm. side of stuff if, if, <laughs> it's it's never of fun course. for anyone yeah, oh yes oh yes oh yes <laughs> so you know it's um, just another one of my list of to-dos uh, and very last question for me uh, is what's next for ryan What's next? Well, with any luck, with Australia starting to open up a little bit more, um, there'll be some more trips on the horizon. Um, mm. I've got a few things tentatively booked for next year, um, and another trip in Congo, um, and another few things sort of on the horizon. Um, so it's just still at the moment in the hands of the government and uh, mm. <laughs> hoping that things um, go the right way for us all. And um, mm. in the meantime, I'm just shooting stuff here. Um, mm and doing bits and pieces of whatever whatever comes about assisting a few other guys that i've known for years um, mm -hmm. who have been here for you know the commercial world picking up my own bits and pieces of assignments trying to find some creative outlets for myself of either you know things like at bedford or, or other things i can either mm -hmm. donate my time to um if it's of interest to me or try and try and pick up some other assignments um just try and stay active i guess photographically um mm -hmm. and Fabulous. Fabulous. I just yeah. have one question too. Um, have you done any work with the Australian Aboriginal people at all in the Northern Territory? Or yeah, actually, um, not in Northern Territory. Um, I worked with a before it was, it was quite a few years ago now, but we worked on a whole um, anti-smoking campaign. Um, Give up smokes for good. It was called. Um, so I was. It's a, a good friend of mine was the the lead photographer on that. Um, Richard Lyons, his name is, and I still work with him now. But um, we did a whole campaign. Um, on, on using sort of Aboriginal elders, local Aboriginal elders and sports stars and um, other people in the, in the Aboriginal community to say, giving little slogans about giving up smokes um, and for health, because it's such a, 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 a big problem in, in the Indigenous community. Um, yeah, and then also some of the, the elders um, in their tribal ceremonies. Um, so we, we've got one guy, he actually unfortunately just passed away last year. Um, Stevie, his name was, he did the whole paint up and the whole um, tribal dance for, it was initiation rites for, for young boys. So it's, it's one of these things that never really gets shown outside the community. So we were privileged to be able to sort of photograph and video that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that kind of thing, it, it's something I definitely am looking to pursue a little bit more it's it mm. kind of fits really in with with what with what i do and, and my love of, mm. of culture and and showcasing these sort of things and, and connecting with people so it's one of those things that um, i'm looking at um and trying to get the sort of right connections and and find something that can can make that work Fabulous. ryan right, um yes ryan yes is the spirit of patrice lumumba still alive in the congo patrice lumumba I don't know. He was the first president. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. The guy who was assassinated by the US, yeah? Yes. <laughs> that ended well for everyone, didn't it? Wasn't he the guy on top of the statue in the Place uh, de la Yeah, it, it would have been, yes. Uh, the Independence Day statue there. Yeah. yeah for sure. well, I, hope, I hope his spirit is still alive. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, he's not, but yeah. He's, 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 yeah. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing mm. place. Such a, um interesting history, um, painful history, uh, and stories like that where they finally get some independence and then, you know, outside forces, unfortunately, decide that they know better and, and want the country to go a different way than what the country does. Yeah. That, that never happens. 
No, no, of course not. <laughs> We've never seen that before, have we? Oh. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions on the floor? I'm conscious of time now. No? All right, look, Ryan, this, this has been um, certainly eye-opening without a doubt. Thank you very, very much for sharing. Um, you know that you've got a friend over here in Sydney when you come over this side, because we, we, we have to sit down and do a few, we have to do a few beers and take a couple of shots with our eight um, For sure. <laughs> right. But uh, look, uh, for, um, thank you to Terry, for Terry as well. Terry's the one who got, um, got us in touch, right? So look, yes. um, I'd love to come back to you, obviously, um, have a little chat with you another time. But um, first of all, on behalf of everybody, club-wise and visitors and everything else, I think um, thank you very, very much for your contribution. Thank you very much. Really <laughs> Without a doubt, you know, um, it's been fabulous. And um, yeah. look, like I say, uh, when we talk, when Brian and I were talking about this before we started, I said in normal times we'd have been sitting down having a beer before and after, yeah. uh, because yeah. uh, in, in normal times we would have been. But um, <laughs> it's lovely, it's lovely that we can still do this kind of thing. So yes. thank you once mm, again. I really appreciate so it, and much. and all look all the best in what you're doing. And um, I'm going to keep mm. very close. I mean, I'm, I'm on your Insta anyway, but I'm going to keep very close to what you're doing anyway, for cool. sure. Mm. Right. Well, thank you. Like Thanks said, again for the invitation. Great. I feel very privileged yeah. to, to be part. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And if you do come this way, please let us know you're coming, right? Because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, sure sure. I'm sure we can do something. All right. Sounds good. I would love to. Uh, so I right, think if you guys are in South Australia, mm -hmm. hit me up. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to regret saying that. <laughs> um, all right. Any other last bits for, for Ryan at this stage? Okay, Ryan, look, thank you for your time, mate, and I will talk very soon. I'll give you a call. Thank right? you very much. Uh, Sounds good. Got, I've got it. Right. Thank you again, mate. Thanks a lot. Right. Thanks, thank everyone. You all. Take care. Bye. All. Bye. 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 Bye.